The um, simplest model, which is very misleading, is the so-called linear model. And those of you who are doing other modules within SPRU will come across this so-called linear model again and again and again. And it's very widespread. Um, it's problematic because it's very misleading. Okay, and the basic idea is that you have some ideas, or it might be some research and development, or it might be some focal invention, and then you have a process, and then you have hopefully success, or at least some outcome. Okay, that's probably the simplest process you're going to get. I mean, what's wrong with that most simple of simple processes? Yeah, it suggests that the idea or the invention or the technology or the R&D is sort of fully formed, yeah, fully baked to use that idea, and then it's really a matter of massaging that and commercialising it. So it's a very linear model where you have some well-formed input, then a magical process and some output. And often that process is nothing more than marketing. So the technology or the invention or the idea is fully formed, and the issue is how do we commercialise that? Um, we're going to argue that really isn't realistic and it's certainly not helpful in terms of trying to manage innovation. I mean, what are the other problems with that very simple model? What are some of the practical problems that that simple model might create? The success is the seeds of the Yeah, this sort of, yeah, very much. You know, it looks like it's all downhill. Once you've got the idea or the technology or the invention, then it's very much downhill from there. And all the evidence suggests that all the sort of value added, all the hard, at least the hard management work, happens in those sort of blue arrows. You know, how do we translate, refine, test, okay, maybe abandon or terminate a potential innovation? So it's one of development, experimentation, perhaps termination. And as we saw from last week, and we see almost in every module that the success rate is variable at the very least, and in some cases not, not good at all. Okay, so what we want to do, one of the things we want to do is open up that sort of process arrows into something that we can actually manage, okay, rather than being some mysterious activity. One of the other problems that it forms, and we discussed that briefly last week when we looked at things like creativity and idea generation, we're saying that actually um, many innovations don't come from a particularly focal idea. Okay, so it's quite misleading to have that sort of linear model. Because if you have that model, then you tend to put your resources in the very early stages. In the jargon of product development, those early stages are called the fuzzy front end. Fuzzy because they're poorly defined. Okay, front end as they're early on in the process. Now that fuzzy front end is very problematic. And if you put your emphasis on the resources there, okay, you end up not putting sufficient resources on management in the subsequent parts of the process. So putting too much emphasis on things like idea generation, on R&D, on invention, means that you don't put enough resources, enough talent, on the subsequent parts of the process. Okay, so the linear model, though it's very seductive, is incredibly misleading about how innovation really happens and therefore how you should manage it better. Because you tend to put your resources and talent in the wrong place and not to focus on the parts that tend to create value in some way. Okay? This isn't just some silly academic debate. It has practical implications about where you invest, in what parts of the organisation, yeah? at what stages in projects and new ventures. So it's quite a serious, if you like, problem. I'll give you an example from a couple of weeks ago. The um, UK government announced, relatively small, I think it's about £80 million, um, R&D new venture to look at battery technology. So far, not so good. Okay, Everyone's done that. EU, US, China, everyone's looking at battery technology. But the interesting thing about this announcement, which was about a week ago, apart from it's quite a modest size, was that it's going to be a collaborative venture between the UK's best universities. I'll let you guess who they might be. Okay, So it included, for example, Imperial, University College London, Oxford and Cambridge, of course, uh, and Newcastle, which is interesting. That probably means they have the technology. So I believe it was five universities. Okay? The problem with that announcement, apart from the small amount of funding, was that it was predicated on this linear model. It's predicated on the idea that for that particular technology, the main challenge 
is one of basic R&D and invention, hence the flow of funds to universities. If you look at that technology, it's actually quite mature. So there's a whole range of competing technologies at different stages of development. And the question is not the invention of a fifth or sixth technology, but choosing the appropriate ones to develop and refine subsequently. And that's an interesting contrast with how, for example, Japan has gone about investing in battery technology. Well, yes, there is some government um, investment in universities, but most of the investment has been in joint ventures and consortia amongst companies. So, for example, Mazda, Toyota and a battery company announced a few months ago a significant joint venture to look at battery technology for the next generations of uh, motor vehicles. Okay? And that's probably more appropriate given the stage of development. So this linear model is not just some academic debate and such like. It's terribly important because it influences where you put your resources and talent, whether you're a government or whether you're a company. So the more realistic our process model is, the more likely we're going to resource and manage the appropriate parts of the process. Okay? Okay. So that's too simple. It's too simplistic. So it's misleading. The other end of the spectrum is something which is 100% realistic. Now, how you might get a process that is 100% realistic, there are many methods. One method is so-called ethnographic. And that's just a smart way of saying that you observe how real innovations happen. So you would observe, say, in a company over a period of two or three years, the flows of knowledge and resources in a real company. And you can map those out over time and across space. The downside of that is you get stupid diagrams like this. It's not really a process other than the fact it has arrows. Okay? There are iterations, dead ends, loops, sometimes infinite loops. Okay? Because that's how it happens in real life if you simply describe real life. What's the problem with that so-called spaghetti model? It's entirely realistic. It's based on real flows in real development projects across time. So what do you think is a major problem with that completely realistic process model? Hmm? Yeah, it can't be easily replicated, and it certainly can't be managed. Now, part of the challenge of any process or any map is to extract some sort of regularities yeah, so you can make sense of it, not to capture everything. Okay, to capture those things that are, if you like, regular, can be replicated, are important. And secondly, equally importantly, can be influenced or managed. Okay, so we need to figure out somewhere between a simplistic linear model, which is very misleading but very seductive and very widespread, versus a completely realistic map of what really happens. So somewhere in between is where we need to be. And I kid you not, there are hundreds and hundreds of frameworks and models and processes that try to position themselves between simplistic and reality. And the trick really is to calibrate one that has you know, sufficient repeatability in a range of different types of sector, and company, and organisation, but isn't so complex like this one that you can't actually use it to manage innovation better. And that's really the challenge. Okay, so there's no perfect process. Okay, some have many stages, some have few. But the objective is the same, right? to extract yeah, the things that are more repeatable, the more general or universal, and therefore the things that you can manage better. Okay? So you're not going to capture everything. So somewhere between the two. And there are, as I said, hundreds of these things from academics, consultants, government agencies and such like. We've been playing around with this for quite a long time now, at least a couple of decades. It's not perfect, it's not the final version, um, but it captures a large chunk of what we know is generally universal, and we discuss how universal in a moment, but generally can be replicated in a whole range of different um, circumstances. That's the first thing. And secondly, it allows us to put the talent, resources, and management in the right areas. Okay? Because we can consume a lot of time managing the wrong things or resourcing the wrong things. So it does those two things. It's not overly simplistic, but it captures things that we know are important and can be replicated, and it allows us then to put the resources and management focus and talent into those areas that can be managed. So we're not claiming, well, we are claiming, I guess, a sort of universal applicability. We'll talk about in a moment the sort of qualifications of where it breaks down, how you adapt it. But generally, yeah, most models, they might use different terminology, they might have a few arrows and things like that in it, 
capture similar sorts of building blocks. Okay? Okay, a few things about this particular representation of the process, because there are various versions of it uh, you'll find on the web and such like, and I wouldn't worry too much about the distinction. A couple of things, or at least several things. Firstly, unfortunately, it looks linear. So we could argue it has some of the deficiencies of the light bulb linear model. That's just how it's drawn graphically. I mean, other versions have loads of arrows going backwards and forwards and such like, but it becomes more like the spaghetti model. So we are not implying, it's simply a graphic representation, we're not implying it necessarily goes from left to right. Okay? That's just how it's drawn. It's not necessarily a sort of linear model. You could, for example, begin on the right-hand side and have an idea about how you might create and capture value. And then you might work backwards through the model and figure out how you might do that. So you start off, if you like, from recognising the opportunity to create value in some way. Or you might start off in, say, the implementation stage. You might have a great team or great resources and figure out, well, what can we do with that? And then you might move to the right or the left. So we're not necessarily advocating a step-by-step -step process. What we are advocating is that these building blocks okay, need to be managed and managed often at different stages of the innovation. But where you start depends very much on a case-by-case -case basis. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, as I said, we haven't put loads of arrows and feedback loops. You have to take them as given. Yeah? Any innovation process that captures anything like reality is uh, iterative. Yeah, it goes down different levels, and it has feedback loops. Okay, but if we draw them on there, it gets like the spaghetti model. So what we try to do is basically have several chunks or groups of activities where we should apply resources, talent, and management focus. And we're arguing that they are largely um, universal or repeatable and can and should be managed, make a difference. Okay, and we'll walk through those in a moment. Uh, any other things? Yes, um, before we walk through this particular model, a couple of things which will come up in a moment. We put innovation strategy and we put the organisation of innovation outside the four core components of the process. And we've looked at the evidence, we've looked at the studies, and we're pretty confident that's where they should be. So we're arguing that in most cases, the innovation strategy, which we'll talk about next week in detail, and the organisation of innovation, which we'll talk about in week four in a whole session, okay, are terribly important, but they're contextual. And what do we mean by that? We mean a couple of things. We mean one is they affect a whole range of different innovations and projects within the organisation. Okay, so they're not specific to a particular innovation or project, unlike the four building blocks. <clears throat> okay, so that's the first big distinction there. Second thing is they're much slower and harder to change and manage. They can be changed and they can be managed and we'll argue that in the next two weeks. But how you do that is more problematic. Whereas the four core processes are more amenable, more flexible, yeah, to adapt and manage on a sort of project by project basis. So for that reason, we try to keep them separate. Yeah, other process models incorporate organization strategy in a central model. I think that's problematic. Yeah, because they have different time frames yeah, and they have different influences on a range of different projects. So the four building blocks in the middle are on a project by project basis and the two contextual factors sort of outlive any particular project. Okay, that's the main distinction. So we're going to park those for a moment. <coughs> Clearly they have an influence and as we go through the model we'll introduce what that influence might be and what that might be. Okay, so we'll walk through that in a moment from left to right but I repeat and I repeat again <laughs> It doesn't necessarily begin that way, yeah? The four building blocks, you could draw them separately with loads of arrows interacting if you want, okay? They're not necessarily linear, and they're not necessarily left to right or right to left, okay? Okay. End of sermon for the moment. Okay.